Hi folks and welcome back to Fisherman Den. Today we're going to be talking about my new range of 3D printed uh, method or hybrid feeders because they're kind of a, a bit of a mixture of both. I'll explain that a bit more in a second but what we've got is a large method feeder. If I show you this is the Guru 36 gram method feeder and if I lay it on top of here like that just try and hold it for you you can see it's actually quite substantially smaller. Now, I know the Guru one's got to 45 grams, so here's one here, and that is a bit sort of more towards the size of this one, but of course, it's still going to hold more bait on my feeder. And then, that's an inline feeder, by the way. The other version of the inline feeder is the wide version, so if we take the Guru 45 gram again and put it on, you can see that by the time this thing's filled up, it's actually going to be pretty substantial ball of bait. So before I explain exactly how uh, this all came about, let me also explain that those are the inline feeders, but I've also got these um, elasticated ones. Don't want to pull it too far because this is the Guru elasticated stem, um, which is easier to use because you can just buy them um, than just insert them. Uh, again, you've got the narrow version and the wide version. The other thing you have to bear in mind is with these that they are also compatible with my standard range of plastic cage feeders with the interchangeable weights. So this one, slightly different uh, way to do it. If you've got uh, one set up, which I have here in good old Blue Peter fashion, let go. <laughs> Caught my guru feeder. Okay, so this is one I've got set up previously. Got a hook on it with a hair, four inch hook length, and it's in line, just sliding. I think that's the Guru bead as well, but you can use whatever bead you like. Just makes it uh, easy to interchange the hook length. So if you want to just change the, uh, the weight on the back, and as I say, this one doesn't have one at all yet, take off the tail rubber, push this through, a little bit stiff at first, and then take it out like that. You can get the Sled, same ones that go on the back of these, just fits in, oops, like that. Take another one of them and slide it in, push forward, and it's locked in place. Then take your stem, trying to do this with a camera as well, it's not easy. Okay, put the, the line through the, the slots, like that. Push through, make sure your line doesn't get caught up. Push through all the way, reinstall the tail rubber, and that's it. You've now got a heavier weight or a lighter weight on there. Now, if you're only changing the, um, the weight itself, you don't have to take all of that out. Just take off the tail rubber, push that down far enough so that it exposes the, the little button here. Then, if you've got reasonably good fingers, you can just push that through. If you have arthritis or something like that, you can just use this and that'll click it out. So, if you want to change the, the, the actual lead weight itself, that's all you have to do. And then push that back through like that. Make sure your line's back in the slot and push the Stem back through, put your tail rubber on, and that's it. So, that's all there is to it. So let's talk a little bit more about why I've made these, what they're for, and um, how I'm going to use them. Well, um, as you've probably seen from my videos, I tend to fish some fairly deep and powerful rivers and some really, really large reservoirs. They're all natural venues, and I'm fishing for carp. And unlike a, a commercial, a smallish commercial or a snake lake or something like that, where there's loads and loads of fish, yes, there are loads and loads of fish, but they aren't all in your swim. So you've got to bring them into your swim. And the way to do that is to use bait. So we generally put a carpet of bait down there and then use big feeders to keep the fish interested. Now, it may well be that I start off, for example, with a cage feeder and use that as a sort of a baiting feeder, because you've seen my particle feeders or bait up feeders as well in previous episodes. Um, if you haven't, um, I'll show you a, a link to one of those. Uh, I'll put up a, a link up above actually for you. But basically, 
that's what you can bait up with. Or you can just keep pushing these, um, these, these, these method feeders out. So that's the, the general idea behind it. And the other thing is, as I say, they're not designed particularly for small commercials. So you wouldn't want to use these on a nine or a 10 foot rod because this one with a 20 gram weight on the back probably weighs something like 35 grams. The wider version weighs probably 40 grams. And then obviously if I've got a 50 gram weight on the back of this one here, um, the feeder itself is 20 grams. And so we're looking at 70 grams. By the time we've got ground bait on there as well, or, or pellets if you wanted to use pellets, you're probably looking at around about 100 grams and not many normal feeder rods, and certainly not these nine and 10 foot ones for commercials are gonna be able to, to do that. So it is a bit more of a specialized um, situation, but really that's what they're for. Now, as I've just said, um, these are all designed by me uh, for use um, with big waters. Uh, they're 3D printed, and I really just got to the point where I thought, well, why keep spending all that money on, on feeders, some of which I end up losing, why not make my own? So today, having shown you what that's all about, um, I'll go on and I'll show you in a bit more detail exactly how I make these things. And in the next video, we'll take them out, and I'll probably go down the river, and we'll, we'll chuck them in, and we'll see how they work. So first of all then, I've got to design it. And for that, I use a thing called Tinkercad. It's just a, an internet-based uh, design software. Um, it's by no means difficult to use. It's actually designed for kids. Uh, but if you want to use um, proper computer-aided design or CAD software, feel free. I've designed it so that uh, it doesn't require support. And that's why these things are all standing up on end. I've also left myself a few notes there to make sure I uh, get everything right when I'm printing. You'll notice I use a raft and the reason for that is because we're printing in the orientation shown on the screen here and we need these things to be able to stand up and so therefore the raft just helps you to do that and again as you can see from the writing on the screen not only do I use a raft I use one which is 15 millimeters of extra margin that just stops them getting knocked over and I have had that in the past where the the print head just fractionally touches it and knocks the whole thing over and you have to start again. Before I can print the feeder, I have to turn the, the file into basically computer speak. Uh, and what we're going to do is turn it into a thing called a .stl file. Um, for those of you who are going to print this, yes, there will be one of those on Thingiverse for you and the link will be down in the description box below. But for those of you that uh, aren't going to do this, let's just move straight on to the 3D printing. This is the method feeder being printed on my 3D printer. Uh, you can see the, the rather large base at the bottom, or the raft. And this is probably about a third to halfway through the process now. So that's the main body printed then. It takes about an hour and a half, hour and three quarters on my printer. Um, depends obviously on how fast you want to print it, but I just got a sort of a moderate pace. Um, the next thing you have to do, of course, is to make the stem for the inline versions. And they have to have one of these little flat areas on the bottom. It's very simple to do. I buy these pastel gel pens, um, just a cheap sort of a, a thing. If you can get them open. Take them apart, pull out the internal section, and then because they're pastel, just run them under the tap and all of the ink runs out and that's you left with this nice little stem. Um, I tend to cut it down a fraction, as you can probably see, it's a little bit shorter than the uh, thing as it comes out of the, uh, the pen, but that's gonna be the stem. And what I do is I get a piece of sandpaper and just rough it all up all the way along itself because we're going to be painting this with some spray paint and to get the uh, flattened area at the bottom kids if you're watching this get one of the adults to do this for you um, lighter I actually do it because I'm left-handed we'll do it this way around just get the bottom so it's burning 
just like that. And then just literally keep it flat down and just dab it onto a piece of uh, board like this. This is just a piece of uh, melamine which is left over from my uh, kitchen. You have to hold it in position for a, a few seconds as you can probably see here. And then once it's ready, it'll come off and that's you've got the raised area we were talking about. I don't know if you can see that. Let me come right in for you there. So that's the stem done then. We've already roughed up this area here and all we have to do now is just get some spray paint. Now, I have to admit, uh, this paint was just sort of a, a light brown sort of a colour and quick spray, let it dry and then just sand it down again because otherwise, if you try and put it in with paint on uh, into the, uh, there it is, to the feeder, um, it could actually just make it very stiff. So I just take the worst of the paint off again and it just leaves it like that. You could potentially, just literally, leave it as the... Uh, standard stem and uh, where am I going that way around yeah that way around um, wrong that way around and just put it in and have it like that if you're not fussed about having a slightly shiny sort of a surface the only other thing we've got to do for the main body is to fit a tail rubber now these aren't actually tail rubbers um, I bought these uh, corda tapered sleeves in muddy brown and they seem to work quite well they fit these uh, stems quite nicely the only thing you do have to do is when they come they've got a really really narrow uh, opening at this end and because you're trying to put the, the line through there it does make it a bit difficult so I just snip off literally a fraction of the the rubber and that opens the thing out and then this fits on quite neatly just like that oops Push that through a bit and that's the main body done so the bodies for the elasticated feeders are exactly the same size and shape as the inline feeders the only difference is that for the elasticated ones the hole for the the stem here has to be made a little bit uh, larger obviously we're using the guru um x safe i think they're speed stem something like that but anyway the guru ones and I'm using the, the longest version of those. And so if I pull off the tail rubber, push that through, you can see it's exactly the same process as before. Uh, if I oops, pick up the right one then, use this one for now. You can see this one is a larger diameter than the one I'm using for the inline. But as I say, in all other respects, it's exactly the same it's just for those of you that want to use inline feeders. Just be aware that a lot of uh, fisheries in the UK don't allow elasticated feeders. So what you could do, if you don't want to be making my inline feeders uh, and these, you could literally take that out of there, pull out, or if, if these ever break, pull that out and just use the hollow stem. And so therefore, you only need to make two feeders. There you go. So you can have stems which are hollow with inline feeders or stems which <laughs> have the elastic in and you can have elasticated feeders and that way you only need to print two. But that's up to you. So the only thing left now is to talk about printing the sleds and also making the, the lead billets that go inside it. Now the sleds are easy. There's an STL file for that and everything will fit quite neatly into your feeders like that. Also the buttons will be on the same STL file but in terms of making the, the lead um, what I do is I actually use plaster of Paris to make a mould like this um, and the way I do it uh, is two ways actually both slightly destructive uh, but one of them is to use it like this there's a base flat base two separate pieces which meet together because remember you're going to have to break the plaster of Paris out of this and then just an elastic band around them this is where the arthritis doesn't help push that down so now you've got effectively a box and two ways of doing it as I say I've got two of these little 
um, 3D printed um, versions of the, the weight itself. These things here. Um, this one is for the sort of, uh, slightly sort of lower weights, the sort of 30 and 40 grams, and this one's more for the 50 grams, so it's a little bit thicker. But you can do two in one mould if you try, or I just tend to do just one in there. And all I do is I put the, the mould in like that, and then I actually use a piece of Vaseline just on the bottom just to hold it in position. Now I'm not going to go through the process of pouring in the Plaster of Paris. That part, you just go onto the internet and you look up Plaster of Paris moulds and you'll see people doing it. It's very simple, just buy the Plaster of Paris at the local DIY store, pour some water into the recommended amount, make sure you've got the bubbles out, then pour it over the top. Wait for it to dry, and in fact what I tend to do is I put it in the oven on a very low heat, probably no more than 70 degrees centigrade, but again, just be guided by what they say on the internet, because I'm by no means an expert on plaster of Paris moulds. When you take it out, you will find that even though the sides of this are slightly um, curved inwards, or not curved inwards, but diagonally inwards, um, they do still stick a little bit. So I do actually put a little bit of Vaseline around these as well to help them emerge from the um, plaster of Paris once it's hard. Having said that, even then I still have issues so I have been known in the past to take when they come out there like that and I have been known to just take a screw, sorry a drill and just screw slightly in there and put a screw in it to pull it out. If you do it when this is still warm the actual plastic will sort of bend out of the way because it's plastic. So that's a way to do it. Oops. And that's, that's what I do for mine. Um, I have tried another way which is these two billets of plastic here are actually molded onto the base of this lower area here. So in other words, that becomes that. And with that one, I have found that it can be kind of slightly destructive, but hey, I'll, I'll put the thing into the STL files for you. If it works for you, great. If not, just do what I do there. Then obviously you've got your mold. And again, you need to go onto the internet I've literally just got some of this old scrap lead here, um, old sea fishing weights and all sorts of stuff I've scrounged up. You have to melt it and then pour it from a ladle into here. Be careful, it is actually very dangerous stuff. You don't want it spitting. You certainly don't want to have any water anywhere near it. It must be completely dry, otherwise it goes off like a bullet. Trust me, I remember back when I was a kid, I actually did that and the thing shot across the room and nearly... Uh, put a dent in my mother's kitchen door, but that's another story for another time. So, as I say, if you're going to do the lead part, then what I generally do is I get a set of scales, measure out um, 40 grams, let's say, or 50 grams or 30 grams of lead, and then I put that into a, a pan, boil it up, not boil it up, what are you talking about, dead? Heat it up until it's molten, and then I pour it into this mould. Now, it may be that at first you do get some bubbling at the bottom um, and that's because there's still some moisture in the mould. So make sure the mould is properly dried out. And what I would suggest is maybe put this into the oven, again, a low heat for an hour beforehand, just to get rid of any moisture that this might have absorbed while it's been in the garage. But basically, that's it. That's all you have to do. I know it sounds like quite a lot of faffing around and for the first time, it probably is. But once you've got all these moulds and everything else sorted out, it's actually very quick to make. Anyway, as I say, that's it. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, as always, click the like button for me. If you want to subscribe, feel free. And until the next time, bye for now.